Today on Earth Focus, African locusts may make cars safer. We'll have the story. The Peruvian anchovy is the source of fish meal for many farmed fish, but fish meal comes at a high social and economic cost. We have Ecologist TV's investigative report. A new program in Fiji is helping to save coral reefs and bring economic benefits to the local community. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson speaks with Coral Reef Alliance director Brian Hughes to find out more. England's Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, celebrate a 250th anniversary. We'll pay a visit. And Miles Benson speaks with Dr. Peter Raven, director of the Missouri Botanical Garden, to see how botanical gardens are adapting to the challenges of climate change. All coming up on Earth Focus. It's called biomimicry, a process of learning from nature and then copying nature's genius to create better design. Today, researchers are finding that African locusts can help make for safer cars. Here's a look. Car manufacturer Volvo is using scientific findings about the African locust to improve road safety for pedestrians. This perhaps sounds like a tall tale, but it's true and it works, says Dr. Claire Rind at England's Newcastle University, whose discoveries may well help to save lives in traffic. I think uh, it was my own experience of uh, driving and of being a pedestrian and realizing that the ability that I've found in the locust would be very valuable in that context. The locust has a very quick reaction and uh, the circuits are very reliable and they do their computation against such a lot of clutter and that's exactly what it's like driving in town. Volvo's aim is to be able to transpose the locust's unique characteristics onto a computer chip and then install this into the car's safety system, something that would radically improve today's techniques. Imagine that you are a grasshopper in a swarm of grasshoppers flying over the fields trying to find, find food. There is almost chaos in the swarm, but there are no traffic rules. Still, the individual grasshoppers are able to avoid collisions. They are, they are really masters of collision avoidance, and we are trying to find out how they can do this. They have a very small brain but that consumes almost no power, but they are still able to avoid collisions and we want to understand why. Every year millions of road users are injured by cars that are unable to stop in time. Radar systems already exist today, systems that can warn the driver if a person or an animal suddenly appears in front of the car. But tomorrow safety systems must react even faster, which will require new knowledge and new technology. If Volvo succeeds in decoding the insect's secret, it would be a revolution in road traffic safety. If we understand the mechanisms, we can choose to integrate them into the car and, so to say, take the best parts of nature of four and a half billion years of evolution and use this for the, for the collision-free uh, traffic system. Dr. Rind has discovered that the secret lies in the locus eye that via nerve cells enables the direct processing of visual information. In less than a millisecond, the locus eye sends signals to its wings and legs that enable it to avoid a collision. It's an amazing uh, thing, sort of the culmination of a lot of work uh, is designing this system. And to be able to put the circuitry of a locust brain into a camera for a, a car, it's an amazing thing. And not, not many biologists have had that experience of transferring their knowledge into uh, a useful application. At Volvo, they have great hopes for this exciting new technology. Well, I think that this technology, parts of this technology, may enter our cars in 10 or 15 years. Uh, it has to prove itself uh, that it's an efficient technology, of course. Coral reefs are the rainforests of the seas. They are among the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet, home to 4,000 species of fish, 700 species of coral, and thousands of other plants and animals. But they are dying at an alarming rate because of pollution, disease, overfishing, and bleaching caused by rising ocean temperatures. San Francisco-based Coral Reef Alliance has found an innovative way not only to help save reefs, but to economically benefit local communities. Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson spoke with Coral Reef Alliance Executive Director Brian Hughes to find out more. Coral reefs 
exist primarily around the equator, why should the rest of the world worry about what's happening to them? Well, look at it this way. The ocean's about 70% of our planet. Coral reefs occupy less than 1% of the oceans, yet they are home and habitat to 25% of all marine fish species. They're dying off? They're dying off. We've lost 25% of our reefs in the last 40 years. And if we don't do anything right now, we can lose 50% of what's left by 2060. And there's a real threat of extinction of all coral reefs by 2100. They are the primary source of protein for a billion people on this planet. The reefs are? The reefs are, coral reef fishes. But it goes beyond that. They're not only a big part of our refrigerator, they're a big part of our medicine cabinet. Coral reefs and the, the species that live in and around coral reefs are highly developed. They've got poisons and toxins. And turns out, these are incredibly effective tools in treating cancer, chronic pain, neurological disorders, and viruses. 50% of all cancer drug research right now is being investigated directly on coral reef species. So we can't turn around without having coral reefs impact some part of our lives. If a reef starts to die, can it be brought back? In the uh, late 90s, there was a tremendous bleaching event where ocean temperatures around the world increased to the point where the corals expelled their symbiotic algae, literally bleaching them white. And many of those areas died because the temperature of the water didn't go down fast enough. But I was in Palau just a few years ago that was very heavily hit by that and saw tremendous regrowth. You have a pretty good project underway in Fiji right now. What's the problem there and how are you solving it? In Fiji, there's a region called the Kumbalau District. It's 11 villages that own an area of reef. And within that large area that they have fishing rights to, they have set aside a tambu area, or no fishing zone, where that's off limits. And it's a vibrant piece of reef. There was a lot of dispute between the villages over who had access to the marine reserve, who had rights over what, who could do what when. And all the while, tourism is increasing and more and more people from outside Fiji were going to experience the reef, and it was beginning to get disturbed. So we began implementing our coral reef sustainable destination approach. And with the community deciding how we were gonna make business more sustainable, all those tourists that were coming into the Namena Marine Reserve, how can we make sure that they're doing it in a way that, that protects the reef? How can we make sure that that marine reserve is truly protected, and how can we get benefits back to the community that reinforces good behavior. And what are the answers to those questions? Very simple. We help the community to develop a user fee so those tourists who were coming to the reserve to scuba dive and snorkel were paying a fee, just like you and I would pay to go to a national park. And that fee goes to pay for a warden system to control poaching and public education so the villages understand more of what's going on in their reef ecosystems. But also importantly, half of the money from that tourism fee goes to put kids into school who've never gone to school before. And so now, about a year and a half after this program has begun, there's 130 children from the Kumbalau district who are in school. And the first graduate ever from the district from the University of the South Pacific. Uh, reefs seem to have a important economic value. What is it exactly? Tremendous. Taken all together, reefs represent almost $400 billion a year to the global economy when you take into account fisheries value, tourism value, and coastal protection. People really want the environment to be healthy. And there is a deep down recognition that a healthy environment means healthy individuals and healthy communities. And sometimes it just takes another way of looking at things to get everybody to come together to work in concert with that goal. If we can show and provide the tools to these communities to say, here's a healthy reef, here's what it looks like, and here's what happens when it is healthy, it pays back benefits to that community far beyond our expectations in terms of more fish on the table, 
more opportunities for employment and the health of their culture and livelihoods. Um, we're an amazing species when we have hope. It's when we have despair that things go quite wrong. Ryan Hughes, thank you very much. Thank you, Miles. It's been a pleasure. The London, UK-based Ecologist is one of the world's leading environmental magazines. Earth Focus brings you its January 2009 cover story in partnership with Ecologist TV, the magazine's film unit. Much of the farmed fish sold in the world is fed on fish meal made from the Peruvian anchovy. The Ecologist investigative report looks at who is paying for the cost of this destructive trade. Cheap farmed salmon is now the fish of choice for millions the world over. But farmed fish need to be fed with significant volumes of wild fish. In Peru, anchovies are fished industrially for processing into fish meal for use in salmon feed. But the fish meal industry has been linked to a host of environmental and social problems. It's a net loss, it's a drain on ocean resources. The guano bird population has declined 95% within just 50 years. Bastante injusto nos parece que se alimenten animales con la harina que se produce aquí, sí, se produce acá a costa de la vida de nuestros niños. The ecologist visited Peru to investigate the true cost of producing fish feed for the salmon sold in supermarkets. With over 40 fish meal production plants and hundreds of anchovy fishing vessels, the city of Chimbote in northern Peru is one of the world's largest ports for fish meal production. And it is at the center of a conflict between fish meal plants and the local communities and fishermen who live there. Maria Elena Foronda Faro has spent decades fighting against the fish meal plants. This teacher has worked at a primary school in Chimbote for over 15 years. Esas ventanas han sido cerradas, selladas con ladrillo porque el humo cuando ingresaba era insoportable. Por lo tanto, ellos no podían estar en clase, se ahogaban y salían fuera del aula. No podíamos seguir haciendo clase. Nuestras clases se veían interrumpidas. A mí me da mucha pena. Yo no puedo ser feliz de ver a mis a mis alumnos que sufren de asma, de dolores de cabeza. Eh, que prácticamente son cadáveres vivientes. Yo me siento impotente. Medical professionals agree that fish meal pollution is linked to serious health problems in Chimbote. Hay mucha contaminación en Chimbote eh, y eso es producto de las empresas pesqueras o de la empresa de la conserva y la harina de pescado fundamentalmente. Y está demostrado que los problemas respiratorios aumentan cuando existe producción de harina. Todos estos problemas respiratorios se dan debido a la contaminación de la industria pesquera en Chimbote, que es un foco de contaminación muy grande. For biologist Romulus Aguila, the problems are not limited to air pollution alone. He claims that these pipes release effluent from fish meal production into the sea. Este, y las fábricas uh, no, no tratan los efluentes, de tal modo de que por el efluente va escamas, van trozos de pescado, van sanguaza, va el licor de prensa y todo va a parar directamente a la abierta. Stefan Austermuir is a marine biologist based in Peru. In 1950, in Peru, the industrial fish meal fishery started. And they fished away first sardines and then anchovies, which are the key element in the food chain. So all the other species, birds, whales, dolphins, sea lions, feed on anchovies. If you take them away, these animals don't have enough food anymore and the populations decline. 
pescadores artesanales se han convertido en enemigos de los, de los lobos porque cuando ellos hacen su captura en redes son los lobos los que van y rompen las redes entonces este, por esa razón ellos los matan pero los lobos a su vez hacen eso porque tienen problemas con alimentación ¿no? nosotros competimos, extraemos más anchoveta y competimos con ellos ¿no? entonces indirectamente la industria pesquera tiene que ver con la, muerte, con la muerte de los, de los lobos marinos. We are liquidating the marine resources uh, in, in an effort to produce this, uh, this salmon product. Right? Salmon are not cheap. We've, we've created a way to produce it cheaply so that the consumer doesn't pay much. However, the cost has just been shifted over to the ecology and to a growing extent, the social systems, the coastal communities that are being degraded uh, in, in the name of, of cheap salmon. Cuando vuelva ya sabrá de mi santo entregar entre la arena sus cabellos. Coastal Peru's most cherished dish is that of ceviche, a combination of raw fish, lemon and onions. It is central to the diet of this region. Yo considero que es parte de la identidad nuestra. Mira. Eh, porque Tiene la, la comida peruana y la, el ceviche en particular nos identifica con nuestros recursos, con el recurso marino costero. But for many, the price of fish has shot up dramatically. Acá en Chimbote dependemos del pescado del puerto, pero ahorita el pescado está bastante escaso. Acá en puerto y traen del, del sur también está entrando. Campaigners claim that the scarcity of fish is directly related to fish mill fishing fleets. Es resulta irracional e ilógico que un recurso tan valioso se deprede y se transforme en alimentos para animales. The International Fish Meal and Fish Oil Organization told the ecologist that the protection and management of the Peruvian anchovy fishery is well established based on science and the envy of fisheries across the globe. The industrial fleet may not fish within five miles of the coast, and satellite tracking of the movements of larger vessels ensures that they do not encroach on the artisan fishing area. The fishermen's union that catches the anchovy for fish meal production, however, has a different opinion. Bueno, en cuanto a que está bien regulada, posiblemente hayan, hayan conversado con gente que que mantienen y quieren seguir manteniendo el sistema actual de anarquía que existe en el sector pesquero en el país. Acá hay una anarquía. Okay. Las leyes existen, no se cumplen, las normas están, tampoco se cumplen y hay corrupción en la administración. Estando prohibida la actividad de la pesca dentro de las cinco millas, no se cumple. Estando eh, el, la embarcación en, en infracción, el, 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 el satelital lo, lo detecta. Pero en el monitor de, 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 de control, simplemente se desaparece la señal. There are several key companies that import anchovy-based feed and oil into the EU for use as salmon feed. One principal company, Scretting, boasts on its website that 49% of the fish used in their UK fish feed is made from Peruvian anchovy. Scretting supply feed to much of Marine Harvest, the world's largest fish farm producer, who in turn supplies salmon sold to Sainsbury's, Morrison's and Young's Bluecrest. Scretting declined an opportunity to comment on camera, but maintained that their suppliers operate sustainably. And I think consumers need to ask questions about the providence of our food and the ingredients that goes into fish meal and fish oil. When people are buying cheap farm salmon, they may be getting more than they bargained for. Que cuando coman un, y disfruten un rico salmón en sus platos, piensen las externalidades y los costos. ¿A qué costos se está produciendo?
botanical gardens have always been centers of research, education, and conservation. Today, with the challenges of vanishing flora and climate change, botanical gardens are taking on new roles. England's Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, which is celebrating its 250th anniversary, is an example. Nearly one and a half million visitors come to Kew to take in the 30,000 living plants on display over its 300 acres. Among the seven million preserved plants and fungi at Kew's herbarium are the specimens brought back by Charles Darwin from his historic voyage on the HMS Beagle. Well, here at Kew, classification is one of the key components, and that's um, learning uh, about how plants are related to one another and what they're called. So if you know what a plant is called, where it's found, what it's related to, and what it looks like, everybody else in the world can work with that, and that's really important for other science uh, areas. So it's a foundation science, and we can use that to build conservation um, strategies so that if people know what the plants are around, they can know what's there and how to preserve it, and that's really important. Today, up to 47% of the world's plants may be endangered, and 13% are at risk of extinction. The major reasons? Habitat loss, pollution, and climate change. The destruction of natural vegetation contributes more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than all of the world's transport systems. And at a time when the world's climate is changing, restoring vegetation to absorb more carbon is more important than ever. As an insurance policy against plant loss, Kew's Millennium Seed Bank has already collected more than a billion seeds. I think the original concept was um, simply the conservation of species, of, of nature, of the biodiversity, but I think increasingly that's become focused on the restoration of whole uh, areas of vegetation in the hope that that restoration will lessen the effects of climate change or absorb more carbon. Uh, and so there's now a, a greater purpose than there was in the beginning. The Millennium Seed Bank's plans for the future are dynamic. Within two years we will have 10% of the world's flora in the bank and over the next 15 years we hope to preserve another 15% making a quarter of the flora in total. The Millennium Seed Bank is an international partnership including 54 nations. The program targets species and regions most at risk from climate change such as alpine and coastal species, as well as those found in desertifying regions. So what's in store for Kew's 250th anniversary? There will be a special display of orchids and native British flora and floral spectaculars for spring, summer, and autumn. So if we can get people to go away with the message that we need plants, we need to look after the plants, and we need to kind of use them sustainably, that's just so fantastic, I think, a message. Um, we can inspire everybody else to do some good. Botanist Peter Raven is the director of the Missouri Botanical Garden, a position he has held since 1971. He taught at Stanford University and is a professor of botany at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Raven is the author of numerous scientific papers and the co-author of the widely used textbook, The Biology of Plants. He speaks with Earth Focus correspondent Miles Benson on what a change in climate has in store for the world's plant life. Uh, you've been running the, the Missouri Botanical Gardens uh, for some years now. 37 years. The, the, the public is generally uh, uh, familiar with the term botanical gardens, some place to take children by the hand and walk them through and show them species of plant life they haven't we seen like before. That. But you do a lot more than that. Yeah. Tell, tell us what botanical gardens are doing. What we do, particularly at the Missouri Botanical Garden in areas where we specialize, like Madagascar and the Northern Andes and Vietnam, is to have resident people there, mostly people who are natives of those countries, for whom and with whom we seek funds, develop major databases, and then translate the information about the plants into direct conservation activities and into activities that will lead to greater sustainability and improved economic lot for the people who live there. Why is rising carbon in the atmosphere a threat to plant life? Science tells us that most terrestrial plants evolved at a time when the CO2 level in the atmosphere was much higher than it is now, four or five times what it is now. Um, so why should that be a problem for plants? Some plants grow better with more carbon as individual kinds of plants, but the climate is changing so rapidly 
that the habitats and the places where plants grow simply won't be there in the future. The uh, Department of Agriculture estimated nine plant hardiness zones in the United States for gardens. Sixteen years later, the National Arbor Day Foundation recalculated where those zones were and they're all about 150 miles north of where they were 16 years ago. In other words, the whole state of Missouri has changed by one climate zone. We grew camellias out of doors in St. Louis last year for the first time ever. They overwintered. So the climate is really changing visibly. What effect will those changes have on our food supply? Lots of the places that we'll need to grow our main crops and the other 100 or so crops that produce 90% of our food directly or indirectly, the main thing we'll have to do is select for ability to grow and be productive in changed environments. You're looking at a world that's beset with problems related to climate change, but in other interviews you've described yourself as an optimist that we can do something about this. As long as we realize that each one of us has something very important to contribute to the future, as long as we recognize facts such as Americans use twice as much energy per person as the citizens of any other nation on Earth and look for ways to conserve that energy instead of relentlessly looking for ways to get more energy to waste. As long as we take what actions we can as individuals in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own states, then we will make a world that's better. Dr. Raven, thank you very much. You're very welcome. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only US network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs that connect you to the world.